Hello, I'm Carly Smith, and welcome to JSA TV's Analyst Alley, your source for tech and telecom trends and analysis. Our very special guests today are CEO of Axiom Fiber Networks, Felipe Alvarez. Axiom Fiber Networks provide telecommunications infrastructure services over its fiber network to carriers and enterprise customers in the greater New York City metropolitan area. And joining him today is Fedor Smith, President and Managing Partner of Atlantic ACM, an independent research consultancy firm serving the telecom and tech industries. Welcome, Felipe and Fedor, and thank you both for taking the time to join us today. Fedor, would you like to go ahead and get us started? Hey, Phil, thank you very much for joining us uh, and taking the time to give us a little more insight on Axiom in the New York City fiber market. Uh, you've been in business now for about 14 months. I'd love to hear how things are going thus far. Sure, my pleasure. Uh, good to uh, talk to you again. Uh, we've been very, very busy. Last time that we spoke, we had been uh, essentially we have business cards. So the first time that we started talking about Axiom uh, with you, uh, since then we've managed to put in about 18 miles of fiber in the ground, high density, 64 strand cable, uh, forming a backbone south of 59th Street, and turn up five of the major carrier hotels in Manhattan, including uh, 111 Eighth Avenue and 60 Hudson, two core and critical uh, carrier hotels to the infrastructure. Uh, so we're 100% operational. Uh, we are also very happy to say that we're turning up our first customer this week, which is a major, major milestone for us. It would be nice to uh, to add eight buildings, which is what we're doing for them, starting this week with four. And of course, investors are happy because they're starting to see some cash coming to the business, uh, sort of like proof of uh, proof of life, you know, for what uh, uh, we're doing. So very happy, a labor of uh, love, you know, some heartache in the process. Building in New York is not what it used to be. It's a lot more difficult. And not because New York ma makes it difficult. The government does not, uh, the city uh, city does not make it difficult. It's just uh, there's so much infrastructure work going on in the streets that it makes it uh, difficult to queue up, you know, who's next, you know, to get access to the conduits and the things that need to get done. Uh, but uh, we managed to do quite a bit in those 14 months. Yeah, and I heard your point, there is a lot of infrastructure work going on. In fact, there's quite a few fiber players at work uh, there. How uh, is Axiom working to differentiate yourself from the, both the newer competitors as well as the legacy players? Um, and how uh, is that working out in terms of both gaining access to conduit and customers? It's uh, conduit access. I mean, I'll start with a, with a last uh, item. Uh, conduit access is not an issue. I mean, it's there. Uh, the access is there. Uh, availability of empty space in the conduit has become uh, has become uh, uh, very tight and in some places non-existent in the part of Manhattan. So it's cer uh, certainly a deterrent to new entrants because you know we have been a lot of uh, segments taken up the last space available. So unless there's a major infrastructure rebuild on the uh, conduit system, I mean, the uh, next uh, player up that wants to put fiber in will probably have to find a, an alternate route, which is often not available either. Uh, makes it more difficult. Uh, from a, a competitive standpoint, I mean, there's uh, there's been a, a very heavy focus on what we call the telecom infrastructure dark fiber uh, business in the city. Uh, there's some new players coming in. Uh, we all have a different aspect as to uh, a different focus. Uh, we overlap, but at the same time, I, uh, for Axiom, I mean, what we're looking to do is uh, be flexible, uh, be very cognizant uh, of what's lacking in the marketplace, which is uh, for the incumbents, you know, and we all know who they are, is flexibility in business terms and delivery. Uh, we're focusing on the speed of delivery, which is also something that will set us apart. You know, we don't take 120 or 90 days to put a building on it. It's significantly lower than that in terms of time frame. Uh, and we're also looking at, uh, again, I mean, looking at what happens in the marketplace uh, when uh, the wireless uh, sector explodes with a small cell development. I think that's where, you know, we're going to see quite a bit of use on our fiber network. Uh, certainly a very key uh, focus uh, for Axiom. But in the interim, we're also enabling uh, competition in locations like uh, underserved uh, buildings, you know, the smaller buildings in the city, the 5, 10, 20 story buildings that are often ignored by uh, uh, by most competitors, except incumbents. And even then, they don't provide the services that are required in, the, in that location. Yeah, when we last looked, or whenever we look at uh, fiber access in New York, we're always shocked by one, the challenges of getting fiber to various buildings, but also the number of buildings that don't have any fiber whatsoever. Um, do you feel that you could build a business in that alone, in terms of hitting those mid-sized, mid-tier buildings that lack fiber? Uh, the core building, 
it, it's a core component of what we do, but it's not the focal point of the business. I think we'll get very good business out of that, especially as we continue to densify the network at laterals of the backbone uh, for either wireless use as well as uh, enterprise or uh, service provider use. But it's, it's a niche area that doesn't have too many players in it. So I'm not giving anything away. I think uh, most fiber providers, uh, certainly the new ones, understand that. Um, but it takes a special talent to actually economically be able to be viable in those buildings. And I think we have that secret sauce, the way we uh, do it and the partners that we work with. So we see it as a core component, uh, not the entire business. I think you know we are diversifying our revenue sources and our target uh, sectors just so that we uh, are able to manage the risk. Absolutely. And you mentioned small cell. Um, obviously, the dark fiber demand for small cell backhaul is going to be massive. Uh, for the last couple of years, a lot of analysts have optimistically talked about the small cell explosion, which hasn't yet really come to fruition. Uh, but it does seem to be getting there, and New York does seem to be the ultimate model of where it will be most useful. Um, are you seeing a lot of real-world examples of that, and do you foresee this year actually being a, an inflection point for small cell deployment? Uh, we see demand uh, from a uh, little girl that the talk stage, the demand. Uh, <laughs> it's a little bit of a hype stage. Uh, you know, we talk about 10, 20,000 cell sites in New York City, uh, things of that nature. But I haven't seen the actual turn up in, uh, in the, the physical turn up of the demand, meaning that people are, uh, the vendors are actually asking for uh, uh, quotes or asking for deployment schedules and things of that nature. So I think that's starting this year. Um, Maybe not in the first half of the year, but towards the second half of the year, you're going to see a lot of pickup in terms of uh, what's there. Uh, some of the approaches, and I think one of the one of the primary approaches that they're, uh, the wireless carriers are taking is where's the fiber and can I enable that uh, rather than say I need a cell site here and then I'm going to drive fiber there. So it's a little bit of a uh, an interesting mix at the moment, but it's moving up the demand curve. Um, last year it was all talk. Honestly, I didn't see any of the what I call the viable signs that there's uh, actions uh, being taken. Uh, we're starting to see this year it's going to pick up speed. So I think the next probably 24 to 36 months are going to, you're going to see the, the major push and influx of uh, driving that fiber you know, closer to where those uh, microcell sites seem to be. Absolutely. And we all know one carrier has sort of been the, the lead driver of dark fiber and small cell demand or, or especially dark fiber. Um, are you seeing that on multiple carrier fronts, on, on most of the big four sort of um, coming through with actual consideration for plans, or is it one or two carriers that are leading the charge? I think the major carriers are all going to push for that. Uh, some are focused on lit services to enable that, which we can do, uh, and actually are, have been planning on doing uh, since day one uh, for those kind of custom applications, as, as we call it. Uh, but the four, one, the, the four they're all focused on it. Uh, I think uh, I think Sprint may have less of a uh, uh, less of a channel, more of a challenge because they may have less funding to do <laughs> what they need to do. But Sprint uh, typically falls in that category. When you speak of lit services, uh, what type of demand are you seeing for lit services? And is it a very regular occurrence that you see enterprise customers for whom the incumbents can't provide the necessary bandwidth? Uh, there's demand. We often get uh, get quote requests for lit services. Uh, we deal with high bandwidth, at 10 gig and above. Uh, we'd rather not dwell into the, uh, the, the what we call the, the old 100 meg is now the 1 gig, right? And the 10 gig is becoming, interestingly enough, the, the old 1 gig. Uh, so, but that's a trend that the industry has faced for, for the last uh, few years. Uh, so we see demand for that, and we're planning to meet some of that demand on a custom basis. I mean, we have the capability, certainly. Uh, the underlying fiber, which is critical, is there, you know, drives the economics. And then lighting that is not uh, particularly difficult, uh, especially for our team. You know, we've done that before a number of times. Uh, the interesting thing is that, uh, that I'm seeing in the marketplace is a resurgence of uh, the 40 gig uh, space, which, oddly enough, I mean, it was uh, written off as being dead a few years ago because of the jump to the 100 uh, gig, uh, the economics and so on and so forth. So I think uh, I think the platform vendors are starting to uh, either finalize or kill off the 40 gig and they're dumping things into the market that makes it more available. But over the last three months, we've got a number of requests for 40 gigs, which again, you know, surprised, uh, surprised to me, you know, in the space. That's interesting. Are there any verticals or segments where you feel there's either particularly high demand or which are particularly well suited to Axiom's model um, and delivery? 
the uh, it, it's across it cuts across. Uh, you'd be amazed. I mean, how many uh, smaller firms that you would think are not in some of this class B uh, smaller buildings? I mean, how many of them are actually looking for 10 gig and 40 and 40 or 100 gig, uh, which is counterintuitive. Uh, but uh, education. Uh, Healthcare. Uh, I think healthcare is a particular interest because they do uh, understand how to uh, the need for security, you know, in the networking, and uh, dark fiber provides that. But they also have a need to have their networks managed, uh, which we can also do on an outsourced basis. Uh, and then you have what I call the usual suspects that understand completely well how technology and telecom technology actually plays in their uh, food chain, if you will. Uh, those are uh, the larger enterprise businesses across the board, but also the financial services firms, who are also very heavy uh, buyer and very interested in what we have to offer. Interesting. Do you think that the network management side of demand is changing as people are moving a lot more elements into the cloud or into colo, where that network management becomes a much more crucial part of their daily business? It, it does. Uh, and, you know, we always looked at it as being we're an enabler to that. Uh, the connectivity, you can, you can manage your network whether it's lit or dark, but dark gives you quite an advantage. Uh, so, Enabling connectivity, I mean, it's essential to the network management as they move uh, to the cloud, and so it has to be reliable. Uh, the bandwidth has to scale uh, very quickly uh, to any demand level that they uh, they have. Uh, so we see ourselves as sort of like the enabler, the pipe that allows them to flow anything and everything at any time, whether it's a, uh, a one meg <laughs> at some point or uh, 200, 400 uh, gig uh, being pushed through. Yeah. Um, in terms of co-location connectivity, your network clearly focuses on reaching all the major colos in the New York area. Um, is that something that most of your customers are focused on as well, or is site to site as much of your business as uh, Colo Interconnect? Uh, very heavily focused on data uh, center connectivity, whether it's in and out of uh, Northern Jersey, you know, to, to pick a uh, point, although we see also demand uh, starting to come in from uh, Long Island as well as north uh, to Westchester, Orange uh, County. Um, so there's quite a bit of that, but that's sort of, sort of a uh, driven by the cloud, if you will, and where some of the data, <coughs> excuse me, the colocation providers uh, are extending their New York City-based POPs or colo centers into a very with a very long dark fiber cross connect into data centers that are more massive and uh, more scalable out in the northern Jersey. Uh, but we also see quite a bit of demand for inter inter-site connectivity, you know, uh, south of 59th Street. In terms of that movement towards data centers and off-site, uh, be it cloud or just traditional data center colo, um, where do you think we are in that process? I mean, in terms of especially business and enterprise customers, are we really just seeing the beginnings of it, or is this well underway and the pace will continue as it is now for a couple of years to reach uh, basically reach the point where everything that should be in a data center is, or are we pretty late in the game? No, I think we're midpoint in the game, uh, given what I've seen. I don't. It's not an early adoption stage. I mean, I think that if anything, what you're going to be seeing and what I've seen is more of a uh, less of a private cloud scenario, more going to more of a public use of the public cloud by most companies, because uh, they're getting more comfortable with the the platforms and the ability to control security and things of that nature. Uh, so you still see that mix of a hybrid, uh, but. The adoption rate is well underway. I mean, I don't think we're in the back end of it. I think, we're, if anything, we're in the midpoint. And you're going to see more of that migration away from the private, pure private, to a hybrid moving away uh, completely into using a, a, a public cloud, if you will, uh, for lack of a better term. Absolutely. Uh, you mentioned sort of platform and interconnection. As a geographically limited carrier, uh, how much of your focus has been on ensuring ease of interconnection with other carriers or other facilities? and and enabling your customers to do that or manage that for your customers. Uh, we're very, very heavily focused on that. I mean, we don't, uh, we're not an island. Uh, you know, physically we may be, <laughs> if you will, but the reality is we're not. You know, we have to be interconnected and we have to have the ability to actually provide services where we do not want to build. Number one, number two is where our customer demand uh, might be. Uh, so we have agreements in place with a number of uh, uh, local, uh, super regional, and national carriers that allows us to extend our network as we see uh, as we see the demand, essentially. Uh, but for us, it's more of an economic decision. You know, a timing of uh, timing and economic decision. 
So in some cases, I mean, you know, we know we're going to end up doing certain routes and an ex expansion, for example, into northern New Jersey. So we have, we're going to have better access to those data centers. But at the same time, it's like it's, the timing is not there yet, you know, so we partner with uh, carriers to enable quotes, essentially, and services in that area. And similarly, I mean, we have partners that look at us and say, you know, I have circuits in LA, I have a customer in LA, and I need to land it in New York, and you can be the, the perfect distribution point, uh, basically, for that. Uh, so we work in the ecosystem. I mean, we're not, you know, uh, no company's an island, if you will. Yeah. Do, you, do you think the intelligent networking and interconnection, uh, more effective interconnection, is really going to make standalone smaller providers uh, like Axiom, uh, a more viable growth model going forward um, versus the previous presumption that in order to service a large enterprise, you had to have a national network. Do you think that's, that's going to be a change in, in what customers expect and where carriers sit on that matter? No, I, I think the current state of the, of, the, of the industry, I mean, allows smaller players and startups like Axiom Fiber to, act, to, to, to do that. Uh, one is that the partnering aspects of it are more open than they ever uh, were before, uh, not only from a business perspective, but also from a systems uh, integration perspective or interconnection uh, perspective. So it's made it a lot easier to outsource, if you will, your network, uh, not only from a core perspective, but also from an extension perspective. So it's, it's a very well-oiled machine right now. I mean, it may not seem like it on an operational day-to-day -day basis. And, you know, if you talk to, if you would talk to our uh, internal folks, I mean, they would tell me that, uh, and I know that. But from a business perspective, it makes us, uh, it, it enables us to be larger than the physical footprint that we have. And part of it is also momentum, right? Developing momentum and then having enough critical mass in some areas that we can say, okay, now it becomes an economic decision whether we want to really expand uh, or not. That makes sense. And in terms of expansion plans, is it pretty much planning to go New York-centric out um, or stay within New York or are there other markets that you consider in the future? Uh, we'd like to stay in the greater New York metro area uh, at the moment. It doesn't mean that we're not going to look at opportunities to expand elsewhere uh, uh, when the right uh, moment comes. But, uh, you know, one of the key things that uh, we pride ourselves on and something that I've done in the past is, you know, just discipline and focus. Right. Mm -hmm. So for the moment, I mean, the focus is, you know, let's get the network out, let's get it rolling, let's establish a, a core footprint and then see where demand uh, takes us. Absolutely. Um, does the presence of networks like Axiom in New York really drive home the obsolescence of legacy networks? Uh, in terms of your competition, is, is, are the incumbents even considered reasonable competitors when it comes to fiber services in a lot of places, or is it all just the newer entrants that you're, you consider more of a threat? It's, uh, it depends. There's some entrants now that are, uh, uh, rather than go after the uh, the whales uh, and kind of nibble at the whales, if you bite off uh, <laughs> the whales, so we're actually fighting each other out, which is not probably the, the, the smarter way to do it. And it's uh, it's really price points. Uh, so you have some newcomers that are coming in with very low price points. Uh, and then there's uh, the, the large incumbent players. I mean, I think we're ju they're just watching what we do. Uh, I don't think they're seeing us as an immediate threat, uh, per se. We will in time become that, you know, I've done this before and eventually I get enough momentum that uh, people start to pay attention to what we do and the damage we're doing in the marketplace in terms of taking market share and, and uh, revenue. Uh, but for the moment, I mean, I think uh, you're seeing the, uh, the new entrants, you know, trying to get some of that uh, incremental bandwidth uh, that's out there, the incremental services that's out there. Um, but again, I mean, the dynamics are uh, at this point are, you know, low price uh, to gain market share. That's what I'm seeing from some of our competitors, the new entrants, the smaller players. Uh, you know, we're not going to do that. We're going to provide, you know, a focus on what we, uh, our core intent, which is, you know, operationally efficient solutions. I mean, flexible business solutions and a solid carrier, a grade uh, managed uh, dark fiber service. Well, and as you know, you know, we spend a lot of time looking at the customer experience and both in the business and uh, wholesale carrier space, smaller carriers who do a great job of, of as you say, having flexibility, um, really making reasonable timelines on service delivery, they, they create a happier customer base that is really committed to them. Um, is that sort of the foundation of your model, to, to be that, that flexible carrier that becomes the partner to the, to the enterprise or carrier rather than just a supplier of connectivity? 
that that's our model. I mean, you hit it right on the head. Uh, it, it resonates. I mean, it resonated with us from the beginning because that's our core value set, and that's what uh, the team that uh, that I'm building here believes in. That uh, that's uh, that's a path forward. You know, the long term view of the business. But it's resonating with uh, with the people that we're targeting and the customer base that we're starting to build. I mean, that's what they like to see. They like the flexibility, responsiveness. That they like the the ability to actually. Uh, work as a partner, you know, with a you know, with a company that provides their services. Uh, so it's resonating very, very well in the marketplace. Makes sense. Uh, just sort of a last checkpoint. I'm curious if you have any predictions or expectations for the fiber market in general, but particularly in New York City, for the coming year or so, and and what uh, what things that have been talked about for a long time might actually come to fruition, and what things have we not talked about that people probably should be keep paying attention to. It's. Uh, it, it's going to be a very interesting year. Uh, so you're the monkey after all, and I think it just brings a lot of instability, you know, in general, according to the Chinese calendar. But the reality is it's going to be very, very interesting because the, the number of players that have entered the dark fiber space is uh, probably not sustainable. Uh, it's not going to happen this year. It'll probably happen sometime next year or the year after, but we're all going to have to figure out, I mean, what do we do? You know, there's only enough demand uh, for dark fiber uh, and even lit services in, in the in the greater New York metro area. Um, well, I'm focused on building the business and getting market share and getting customers. So the focus is going to be very, very, uh, uh, it's, it's not, uh, it's going to allow us to get what we need to get, which is the uh, our beta revenue goals and all of that. But it's going to be interesting in the dynamics with uh, the new entrants as well as the incumbents. Uh, so unstable year, I mean, from a market dynamic perspective, there's going to be a lot of ups and downs. You're going to see the pricing. Uh, that the pricing uh, will become interesting, and I know you'll track that very closely and uh, be interesting trends. Um, I don't see a major uh, tectonic shift in demand in terms of uh, new things that we should people should be looking at that are not looking at. Uh, I'm very pragmatic. I mean, I look and I say, look, the wireless thing is going to start taking off. You're going to see a lot more uh, demand for the fiber to be driven very, uh, very finely into a lot of locations that previously would not uh, be all enabled uh, by the wireless uh, sector, breaking up those cells. Um, so more of the same high level of intensity and the uh, ramp up and the takeoff of the wireless uh, uh, sector going to the small cells, for real this time. <laughs> actually happened. Uh, we, yes, we actually have. It's been uh, the, the wireless uh, run has been wonderful for fiber players thus far, and it would be nice to see that continue. I, I would hope so. <laughs> So, Phil, thank you so much for taking the time. Really appreciate it. Uh, back to you, Carly. Really appreciate the opportunity to be part of the, the, uh, the broadcast. Well, thank you both for joining us today, and thank you for tuning in to JSA TV's Analyst Alley. See you next time.